Massimo Piliucci, it is very good to be with you again. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. How about you? I'm doing great. Let's do our standard meet and greet, and then we can get on to our topics. Sounds good. Go ahead. Well, I'm Massimo Piliucci. I'm a, a professor of philosophy at the City um, College of New York City, a part of the CUNY system. And I am Dan Kaufman. I am professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. So uh, our topic today uh, really is um, on the relationship of academia and academics to the general public. Um, we have touched on this topic in previous dialogues, but mostly indirectly. Um, we touched upon it certainly in talking about your new webzine, and uh, I hope that we're going to we'll, we'll be able to talk about that a little bit. As it's, am I correct, nearing your one year anniversary for Scientia? Yeah, Solano? pretty. It's getting close. Yes, in a month or so. Yeah. So it's probably not a bad time to take a little stock and see uh, and see uh, reflect on how how you think it's doing and whether it's meeting the aims you set. And you've made some minor changes, and so maybe we'll talk about that at the Sounds end. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so. The first thing that I wanted to, to get a sense from you about, and maybe in this sense, it's good that you and I are at such different kinds of places, because maybe between the two of us, we can have a fairly representative viewpoint. Um, what? Oh, a sample what size of your... two is better than one, for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you're in New York, I'm in the lower Midwest, right. you know, that sort of yep. thing. Um, you know, you're at an R1 institution, I'm not, right. um, and, and all that sort of thing. Um, what is your current impression of the public's perception of academia and of academics right now. Um, I, this used to go under the sort of what are the town and gown relations, um, but I'm really talking about this sort of nationwide. What, what, what sort of, what do you think is the perception of the public of academia and of academics right now? Uh, that's a good question. And I think it actually has different answers depending on how you break it down, right? So for instance, there, there's a, a recent poll that shows that scientists uh, not all of whom, of course, are academics because they, they, they work in a variety of settings like NASA, for instance. Uh, but, you know, a lot of scientists are in fact academics. Uh, so scientists are very highly regarded by the general public. Uh, this has been consistently the case for a number of years. Of course, that's the good news. The bad news uh, is that despite this high esteem, most of the public or a large chunk of the public ignores scientists' opinions about, um, you know, public uh, public policy and, 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 uh, and um things like vaccinations and climate change, and uh, uh, they also ignore uh, or reject uh, scientists' opinions about fundamental science, such as you know, Big Bang and uh, evolutionary theory and so on and so forth. So we have this really weird situation in the United States where, on the one hand, uh, the public says that they have a high level of trust in science and, the sci and scientists as a group, uh, and therefore a high level of trust at least for some, for one subgroup uh, of academics, but at the same time, they seem to reject whatever it is that they don't like uh, coming from that group. So that's one thing. Uh, in terms of, of academia more generally, on the other hand, it's, it's a little more difficult. I mean, you, you do to, to know what the public's uh, reaction is. Uh, you, you do hear and read often enough about, you know, belittling of the humanities, for instance, and, you know, uh, how, uh, much of a waste of time it is to get a, de a degree in you know English literature or philosophy or history or whatever it is. Despite, by the way, even there, uh, lots of empirical evidence that actually shows that degrees in the humanities uh, do pay pretty well after graduation. There is high, fairly high employment rate of uh, graduates in the humanities and so on and so forth. So there is this uh, very complex scenario where, on the one hand, you know, a university professor at whatever place he or she happens to be. Um, does carry a, a, a sort, of, sort, of, sort of social cachet um, with, with it. That position does. But at the same time, uh, there's also this sort of anti-intellectual, uh, if you will, tendency for people to say, to dismiss members of you know, the Ivory Tower, how oh, these people are just their heads in the clouds and, and so on and so forth. So it's a really complex sort of, a, I, I was about to say, almost love, hate-love relationship between the public and, and academia. Yeah, so let's um let's unpack some of these things and uh, and maybe uh, uh, I'll add a few things that, that you can reply to. Um, for, first of all, um, with respect to scientists and the esteem with which scientists are held, 
then in contrast with some of the examples you gave of the public refusing to sort of uh, accept the, 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 the conclusions that scientists draw, when those conclusions impact on public policy and the like, uh, but even where they don't, like for example, in the theory with respect to the theory of evolution, doesn't really impact public policy very no, much. Right. Um, um, but let me ask you if, and this is something I do want to discuss in full a bit later. But is this partly because, at least in some of the areas you've described, there is at least some competing expert opinion? In other words. Mm. Um, in the case of climate change, in the case of some of these other things, um, there are some voices on the other side who, at least on paper, uh, are also experts or have sort of relevant credentials. Right. And, and I'm not suggesting necessarily that, 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 that they're correct or, or, or anything like that, but I'm wondering if, if there were no voices, if there were no Freeman Dysons and no Bjorn Lombergs and none of these people expressing, voicing any sort of hesitation mm. about the full implications of climate change, do you think there'd be as many deniers as there are? That, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm afraid the answer is yes. Uh, and, and I'm saying this for, for this reason. So you're, you're right. Uh, obviously, there are these occasional so-called skeptics. I actually was one of the people who signed the recent petition put out by the Skeptical Enquirer magazine and their publishers uh, asking the media not to use the word skeptic. Uh, in, in cases like uh, denial of, of uh, climate change and, and, and so on and so forth, because the word skeptic, you know, we would like the word skeptic to be a positive word, somebody, you know, to, to characterize somebody who actually uh, proportions uh, his beliefs to, to the evidence and not somebody who just rejects um, uh, the evidence because it doesn't agree with their beliefs. So I really don't want to use the word skeptic, basically, in, in that sense. But, but it's true that for climate change, for vaccines and autism, alleged connection, which is not there, and, and for a number of other issues, you can always find somebody with academic credentials or at least with research credentials that will do and say the opposite of what the majority or the consensus scientific opinion is. That's just human nature. I mean, that, that's always been yeah. the case. You will always find... Uh, people who are contrarians, people who either genuinely because they actually do believe themselves to be, you know, sort of a Galileo kind of, you know, this, I, I call this the Galileo complex. Uh, you know, no, you, nobody, nobody listens to Galileo and look at that. He was a genius. And he was right. Nobody is listening to me. Therefore, I'm a genius and I'm, I'm right. Uh, it clearly doesn't follow. It's a sort of an elementary logical fallacy. But it's, you know, I, I do understand that there are people who are genuinely actually um, uh, actually believe that that they are right on these issues. Uh, there are others who probably just make a good buck out of it or they feel good in terms of publicity or that, that, that these issues bring them. Whatever the motivations and uh, you know which are probably complex and often a combination of all of the above, it is definitely not difficult to find, especially in modern times where the, where the academic community is very large and, and where there's all sorts of people from all, all walks of life uh, there are into academia, the work within academia, it's not difficult to find the lonely or uh, voice that is sort of contrarian. And certainly that does boost uh, the, uh, the self-confidence of what I would call the denialists or pe people who actually deny sort of things like climate change um, and, and so on. Uh, however, I don't think they're necessary because, I mean, think, of, think about the, the quintessential case of denialism, which is um, uh, evolution. I mean, this, it's very difficult, if not, if not impossible, to find a, a credentialed biologist who actually is a creationist. As it turns out, there are a few, but very, very few. I mean, and none of them has, is in any position of, of preeminence within the academy. And yet, uh, rejection of evolution as a, as a scientific theory has been going on strong in the United States for more than a century. And so I, I think, I do think that these things will happen anyway. I mean, the, the, the whole anti vaccine movement, even though it's true that there, it was started, uh, so the pretext was a um, uh, bad paper that was eventually uh, retracted uh, a number of years ago, but really it came to people's attention, mostly because of Jenny McCartney's uh, and Oprah Winfrey's, um, uh, you know, banging about uh, around the, this issue and saying, you know, I don't need the science, I am my, my son, my son is my science, you know, and things like that. Um, so I suspect that these notions have been around and will be around regardless of people's attitudes toward academia and this regardless of the fact that there are uh, some academics who support them. Of course, it does not help 
uh, and in fact, it's significantly hurt, I think, uh, when there are, uh, when one can point to uh, another so-called expert who has a different opinion uh, about these things. So it, it's a, it, again, it's a complex issue, which is um, unfortunately sociologically complex and therefore not just a matter of, you know, sort of explaining how things really are, you know, here's the facts, you know, just to make up your mind and then you get to convince people. It, it just doesn't work that, that way. Yeah. And, and I do, one of our topics that I might want to make sure we do get to is the question of the appropriate role of experts in right. public policy, how we determine who experts are and the stuff which we'll get to. I just, I just wondered whether you thought that, um, that the fact that in some of these areas, I mean, there aren't really any um, uh, uh, gravity denialists, right? No. <laughs> um, um, and that's because there really isn't anyone out there uh, uh, sort of preaching against the, the theory of gravity. Um, but there, there are people, you know, in biology and chemistry who are at least uh, on the intelligent design team. Correct. And there are pr pretty prominent scientists who have at least expressed some caution about climate science. But I, I appreciate your point that you think that the amount of denialism in the country would not noticeably change even if there weren't such experts. Probably, as probably not, yourself. right, probably not. I mean, okay. you know, this is obviously an empirical question. And, and yeah, yeah, in yeah, fact, yeah, yeah. one could do yeah. uh, presumably a sociological study and see what is that relationship. You can probably disentangle these variables uh, statistically. I mean, you cannot do a controlled experiment, obviously. But, uh, but in social science, there are sophisticated uh, uh, methodologies that you can use in terms of, sort of statistically controlling for these kind of things. You know, how many experts have actually been out there uh, supporting the contrary opinion, uh, and right. then, you know, does that correlate to uh, a stronger rejection on the part of the public? I suspect the answer is going to be no, but it's uh, but it, it is an open question. Yeah, it's a it's a guess. Um, um, OK, so let's not talk, move to some of the other. So, so we, that's the that speaks to the scientists and the scientific community. And then you very correctly talked about that, that your perception is that the people in the humanities and the liberal arts are held in significantly lower regard. Right. Um, um, one of the things you didn't mention, which I thought um, does strike me, at least in the United States, as being relevant, is that um, there is a widespread perception that certainly the humanities and liberal arts professors and also some of the social scientists are uh, politically biased, right. that they're liberal. Yeah. Um, and so there's this sort of this stereotype of, or if not a stereotype, maybe it's true, of liberal academia which I think has also played into some of the negative, um, some of the negative uh, uh, impression that people have of the academy. Uh, I accept the, the, your point also about sort of a genuine, a general American anti-intellectualism, which has always been true uh, and has been well chronicled right. by uh, earlier than us. Uh, um, but I also, I, I, I wonder if um, I might talk a little bit more just about the perception of uselessness. Um, it seems to me that in a sense, higher education has moved from being essentially a relatively um, small scoped endeavor whose purpose was primarily to educate the ruling classes right. to become a kind of an all purpose mass education for white collar jobs. Yeah. And I wonder if that, A, by necessity has changed the attitudes um, because if you think of it in that way, uh, as as tra job training for white collar jobs, as opposed to thinking about it as cultivating of the sort of personalities and characters that we want running the country, um, you would have very different perceptions of what's important and what's relevant. Um, um, and so I wonder if you think that the shift from the of the academy to a mass education model has had something to do with yeah, this. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. But before we get there, um, and yeah. I, I want to go back to your earlier point, which is the, the idea that there is a political bias within the academy. Yes, please. So I, please, I actually do think that there is, although we need to be careful about uh, the use of the word bias. So this is a, a, a discussion that I've had indirectly several times with Jonathan Haidt, who is a sociologist at uh, NYU. Yes. And I, I take yes. him to task and uh, several several times on, on this kind of topic because he's you know he's famous for making that kind of statement uh, about the fact that the academy is liberally biased. In fact, at some point, even went so far as to propose a affirmative action for conservative uh, hirings among, among yeah. faculty. Yeah. Now, um, the problem with height, uh, it, well, there's a number of problems with, with Height's claims. One of them is that once I started looking, started looking into his data, actually, that, that was, it, it seemed to me fairly questionable the way he collected the data. 
uh, and con did control or did not control for sort of obvious variables. But but besides that, I'm actually willing to grant that very likely there is in fact such a bias. If by bias we simply mean a disproportionate number of faculty in uh, liberal arts colleges and universities in the United States tend to lean liberal. Um, this needs to be qualified. First of all, it probably varies from field to field. I suspect, for instance, that that's not true in economics. Um, yes, and, yes. You know, uh, and there are, you know, it may, it may be more true in certain areas, certainly more true in, in, in um, areas such as uh, English literature, probably philosophy to some extent, uh, certainly the, var the, the different kinds of studies, so gender studies and you know, African-American studies, that sort of stuff. That's probably true, uh, very likely true in that case. Um, much less so probably within the sciences where the thing is actually entirely, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's orthogonal really to what you're doing. Um, but let me grant Haidt's general point that there is a bias in that sense. Well, then the question is, well, why is there a bias? And of course, by, by, by um, proposing a, uh, the, the academic equivalent of a affirmative action for conservatives, he's implying, in fact, he actually stated that clearly in a couple of, of his writings, um, that there is a conscious bias, meaning that there is an actual hiring, you know, uh, discrimination, essentially, that leads to the bias. Um, it seems to me that's a fanciful explanation for which he has absolutely no, uh, no basis. And much more likely, it's the fact that certain kinds of people get attracted to certain kinds of jobs and not others. I mean, think of it this way. I mean, I, I'm, making, I'm, gonna, I'm about to make an example that may sound facetious, but it's not. Uh, how many liberals, you know, die high, die high liberals you think are uh, currently employed on Wall Street, especially at the high levels? Uh, probably very few would be my, my, right, my, my right. And so should we have a, uh, you know, a, a affirmative action uh, employment for liberals on Wall Street? Probably not. I mean, the, what's happening there is that certain professions are uh, sort of neutral from a point of view of, of ideals and, and political positions, but others are not. Uh, you know, most conservatives, uh, or at least a significant chunk of conservatives, don't see themselves spending their, their life in a job that uh, is about, you know, sort of teaching other people about sort of critical thinking and, and, and the realities of, of, you know, how to understand how to navigate the world for comparatively little pay, even though it does come with some benefits, uh, such as, although increasingly less so, tenure. Uh, they just don't see a lot of people. I would I would say don't just see that as a particularly good way of spending your your, your life. I mean, I remember since we're talking about anecdotal uh, evidence here, uh, you know, my own father who was a staunch conservative, um, he was adamantly opposed to me going in academia, and the reason for that wasn't because he was worried about the liberal bias of the academy. He was just worried, worried about the fact that I wasn't going to make enough money. Uh, to yeah. enjoy, you know, my life, and the same again. So the other way around, you know, why is it that so much, that, that not many liberals likely uh, go work on Wall Street? Well, because that environment comes from a certain kind of culture that is really not particularly conducive or not particularly friendly to certain kind of political outlook. So I do agree that there is a very likely a bias within the academy. I also don't think it's it's something to worry about because it's a natural bias. I mean, I, and nobody's actually actively keeping conservatives out of the academy more likely than not they keep themselves out of it because they're just not interested as i said with some exceptions such as uh you know a lot of departments in economics maybe law to some extent uh in, in other places so that that goes for 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 the bias in the academy now back to your to your broader question which is you know what the the, the mass education the move to, toward mass education uh, and essentially the reconception of, uh, of um, uh, college as... Of the, of the, pr of the purpose of the purpose of, of yeah. college, right, yeah. as, as yeah. sort of preparing people for white-collar jobs. Yeah, I, I do think that you, 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 have, you have a point there. Uh, that has generated problems and is generating problems. Um, I think the situation actually is significantly different between the United States and most other Western countries. At least that's my take when, when I... Uh, think of and, and, and talk to colleagues abroad. Not not because you know other countries are not going to similar kinds of, of sort of reforms and, and, and changes, but it's happening more slowly and it's happening in much less of a sort of a brunt way than than it's happening in the United States. Um, and so you can still see diff significant differences between the United States and, and, and other Western countries. And in particular, what I what I think is is happening here is that 
uh, first of all, we got into this situation where unless you have a college degree, you essentially don't, you're not going to find employment, you know, gainful employment, uh, uh, except for doing sort of menial jobs and, you know, very badly paid jobs. So the bar has been raised. In fact, the bar is in the process, I think, of being raised even, even more uh, to the point that if you don't have a master's degree, uh, now you don't find you know significant you know remunerative employment in, in in a number of areas almost regardless of what that degree actually is is in in what, what kind of field. Um, there is a bunch of reasons for this. Uh, one of which is that American high schools, frankly, do a horrible job at preparing people for what comes after, both in terms of career and in terms actually of pre college. I mean the statistics here in New York was astounding just last week. Uh, the New York Department of Education published this this um, uh, survey that shows that only 30% of uh, high school graduates in, in New York State are college ready, which of course implies that 70% are not. Um, now, my quest, my, my, my immediate question would be, why did that 70% graduate to begin with from high school? I mean, if they're not college ready, and they're probably going to college, most of them are going, are going to college, why exactly are they, uh, you know, coming out with, with a diploma? I mean, high school is supposed to put you in a, in a position to be college ready if you want to pursue that, that career. Of course, it's not, it's not the only option. So it's the entire system that has become uh, really corrupted and, 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 and problematic in the sense that we are now seeing uh, college as just a, a, yet another station over an increasingly longer waiting period before people actually can enter the, the workforce. And if you don't have that college degree, then you're not going to you know, likely to go anywhere interesting. Uh, but now since everybody or almost everybody is required to, to get to that point, that college degree is becoming increasingly less meaningful and, and people are moving up to sort of the level of, of, of graduate uh, um, degrees. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, it seems to me that we should have, uh, you know, uh, a college opportunity for everybody, which is not the case in the United States, given the incredibly high tuition rates um, at American colleges. I can tell you from first experience because my, my daughter is about to enter college next year. Uh, she's graduating from high school in a few months. And I know firsthand what that means, even in terms of, of so-called public schools, because a lot of public universities are actually increasingly less public. They don't get, they get almost no, no funding. Uh, from their, their respective states. So the tuitions, of course, go up in, in, in an incredible uh, fashion. So access to college is getting actually more and more difficult, or it's getting people in more and more debt if they actually do get access. But at the same time, we want to sort of guarantee the outcome, which is really nonsense. I mean, I have had, I, I can't tell you how many countless discussions I've had to, with my previous uh, uh, deans and provosts in my, in my previous employment where they were saying that the state legislature in New York is concerned about one thing and only one thing in terms of outcomes. They want to, the graduation rates to go up, actually two things, I suppose, and the time to graduation to be reduced. Now, I pointed out that if those were really the only two criteria of importance, uh, those are easy to solve problems. Just allow me to give passing grade to everybody regardless of what they do and they will graduate on time <laughs> and you know and and you have a graduation rate of 100 percent right. clearly that's not the case and that's not the problem right i mean hopefully right. that's not the problem so uh but that's the way they see it because those are of course uh, I, I don't want to start a whole separate uh, sort of side discussion here but this is one of the the perils of uh so-called assessment exercises which are quantitatively based uh, I don't have anything against assessing outcomes. Uh, I mean, that's what we do, for instance, when we grade papers, right? Uh, yeah. We assess outcomes. You, you have to know what the, how the students are doing. And so it makes perfect sense to me to try to know at, the, at a university level and then at, at a systemic level how uh, things are done, you know, if they're done well or not. But the problem is that when you need to assess, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds or thousands of faculty and in, 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 uh, in, uh, courses at large universities, uh, people tend to focus on uh, the stuff that it's easy to measure. And the stuff yeah. that is easy to measure, such as graduation rates and time to graduation, is not necessarily the most indicative. In fact, in this case, it's not indicative at all. Uh, there's, it yeah. seems to me that there is almost no correlation between the time to graduation and how much that person actually, the student, has actually learned uh, from her staying in, uh, in college. So it's, it's really a complicated and it's increasingly corrupt system. I suspect, I mean, you, you've heard... Um, Lots of people um, over the last year or two predicting the bursting of the bubble, of the college bubble. 
Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's not going to be as, ter as terrible as the bursting of the housing bubble back in 2008. Uh, but there is a there is a good point about so there's a reason to talk about a, a college bubble. You, we do have a generation that is learning increasingly less, that is increasingly less prepared to not only enter the workforce, which is one of of the objectives of, of a college education. The other one is frankly to enter life. You know the the, the point of, of a liberal arts education is to to allow you to, to, to uh, mature as a person and therefore to make up your own decisions and in, as a member, an active member of a, of a liberal uh, as, you know, social yeah. democracy. So, yeah. you know, there's that. Now, not only we're doing less of a job at that, but, but that job is costing these people incredible amount of money. And, they, and we have graduates, you know, college graduates who come out with huge debts, you know, often the equivalent of a house mortgage. And so it's something's got to give one of these days. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm afraid to even go and predict exactly when and, and, and it's going to happen and how it's going to manifest itself. But something will, in fact, happen. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me say a few things about this. I mean, the last point you just made, actually, from what I've been hearing, the, 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 if, if by the college bubble you mean the prospect of a whole generation or two generations of students defaulting on their student loans, I've actually heard that that's going to be a worse crash than the uh, than the housing crash because there's more money. Yeah, you, you, that's right. You have a point there. Um, that's right. That, um, the money is and amazing. Part of, right. And part of the reason why there's this prediction that there's going to be so much default is because increasingly the college degree is no longer translating into the kind of earning. Right. That it used to. So, so I think there is a, a I think there is a, a big financial crisis looming uh, with respect to this if we don't do something. In terms of going back to what you said about comparing the U.S. to Europe, I mean, I think part of the reason why academia is not quite declined in the esteem in Europe as much as it has in the United States is partly because the university has not become as much a, a system of mass education in Europe as it has in the U.S. because in, the, in Europe there is still a substantial vocational track. That's right. In other words, uh, and, and that the people are tracked relatively early. That's right. Um, and, and this is partly because in European countries they've protected their trades. And they protect, in other words, they don't just let the, they have more planned economies. Yep. And so they don't just let, you know, okay, fine. We're not going to have any manufacturing anymore. All we're going to do is either produce brain surgeons or hotel uh, uh, waiters. That's fine. Europe doesn't do that. They, they, in a sense, manage their economies more than we do. And right. so it seems to me they've preserved a kind of career track that allows a lot of people to go that way and make decent livings. But what that also means is that the university doesn't turn into this all-purpose kind of generic um, uh, uh, degree mill to quite the deg degree it does in the United States. And that, in that sense, uh, uh, the university there isn't playing the same role it is in the U.S. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, in fact, I can give you yet another uh, piece of anecdotal evidence from personal experience. So, you know, I grew up in Italy. And uh, I, am, I have two brothers and one sister, and I'm the only one of the four who's gone to college and then eventually to, to graduate uh, studies. And this is not because we couldn't afford it. Uh, we, you know, our family could definitely afford all four of us go to college, not a problem because the expense is much, much lower. I mean, we're talking about a fraction, I mean, less than 10% yeah. of what it goes, or what, it, or what it, it takes to go to a state university here, forget a private school. So that wasn't the issue. The issue was simply that, you know, my uh, my siblings didn't think that that was the what they wanted to do. They rather uh, go for, for a career that uh, employed them immediately. And in fact, sure enough, they got employment. Um, in one of them, so my, one of my brothers, is a, a flight attendant for Alitalia, and he is the sole breadwinner for his family. Hmm. Right. So so we're talking about somebody who with a high school degree. Right. Who has been employed uh, gainfully for the last, you know, 20 plus years. Uh, and in fact, almost 30 now, <laughs> and uh, he has absolutely no problem from that perspective. I mean, he's paying a mortgage for his house. He's got two kids. Uh, that sort of thing is not possible in the United States. It hasn't been right. possible for a long time now. Um, That's right. And uh, so you're right. There, there are definitely uh, there, there is this issue of you know vocational um, career. But what one of the things that actually worries me is the push from the corporate world and also from 
the what I see as the increasingly misguided and corporatized, uh, uh, you know, upper administration of a lot of American universities, uh, this this push to actually make turn colleges into essentially trade schools. Uh, you know, so there is all these yeah. th this emphasis on STEM um, uh, fields and this de-emphasis on the humanities, this de-emphasis on any any other field that is perceived correctly or incorrectly, by the way, because as it turns out, as I said, the, 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 this data out there that shows that actually, uh, for instance, graduates in philosophy do much better than, uh, than a lot of the other graduates, including a lot of the STEM graduates, uh, you know, with, with some exceptions. But it's not like if you become a biologist, you find employment much more easily than if you uh, come out with a degree in history or in philosophy. Right. So, uh, so there is there's this tendency, this push, very overt push, to turn colleges into trade schools. And um, that's precisely because we got away from a model, from a European type model, uh, where the trade schools are distinct from college. College is not a trade school. College is supposed yeah. to be a liberal arts education and supposed that's to be right. you know, broader uh, and preparatory for sort of life in general and not just specifically for a particular career. Now, I suspect that this is convenient for, uh, for the private sector. Uh, they, they want people, uh, although even there, it's actually the situation is more complicated than one might think, because one of the, the, the things we get constantly uh, from private employers at, at my college is, well, we need people who know how to write and think critically. And all. in other words, they need philosophy graduates and they need, you know, people who actually know how to um, think on their feet and, and they're flexible in what they're doing and, you know, can reinvent themselves and all that sort of stuff on the one hand. But on the other hand, they, there's this insistence toward, well, you, you want to go into the STEM fields. Well, the STEM fields are the, the ones that prepare you the least for that kind of flexibility and those kind of portable right. skills. Uh, you know, if you're a chemist and you, you graduate in chemistry and you find place uh, uh, of, of employment in, in chemistry, you're fine, you're good. But if you have to reinvent yourself and if you have to go from one type of job to another and, and draw on a number of sort of portable skills, probably chemistry is not your best bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it sounds to me like we agree a little bit that um, that part of the problem is that we're using the university for something that it's really not designed to be used for. Correct. And, and then as a result, it's not, I would say it's not all that surprising then that people's attitude as to what counts as success change and thus their attitudes towards the usefulness of various discipline changes. Right. Um, um, uh, the one last thing I was going to say with regard to um, the political bias, and then we can, and we can move on to the, the next uh, topic is that, um, I do think on the one hand that you're absolutely right. And I also never understood why the fact that somebody has an opinion is supposed to be a disqualifying. <laughs> um, well, in the sense that in the sense that surely the relevant thing isn't that he has the opinion. The relevant thing is, is he teaching the right material right. and is he grading fairly? Right. right. Um, so I always my policy just to make this easy is I tell the students right up front what I think about everything. Yeah. And um, they then get to see that. I'm not only teaching that side <laughs> and they also get to see that their grades are not affected by the fact that they're not on that side. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I tell my students and, to basically uh, Google me and they'll find out my opinion right. about anything they want to find out. My right. Opinion about, so. right. right. <laughs> now, now, but that's, so that's one sense of bias, but there is another sense that I think maybe is a bit uh, fairer. And that is there are disciplines and I'm thinking specifically in the social sciences that actually define themselves partly in terms of a social, what they call a social justice mission. Right. And so I've talked to, actually, I just had this conversation yesterday with a former department head of a combined anthropology and sociology department. And he told me that at the, at the heart of their mission, uh, both the sociologists and the anthropologists, they see part of what they do as social justice. Wow. Now, that to me basically entails that at some level one is not entirely engaging one's subject matter in a critical fashion, right? Yeah. Um, and so I wonder if there is a sort of a public perception maybe that filters out that some of these disciplines really are disguised uh, advocacy uh, yeah. uh, uh, operations yeah. rather than dispassionate critical yeah. subjects. Now that you're absolutely right. And of course, the situation is even more marked in, in the case of a number of studies uh, programs. Uh, you know, this is going to sound yeah. very politically incorrect. And so I'm sure I'm going to get hate mail. 
but it's it's actually very obvious. I mean, people in those in those uh, programs often do uh, explain things the way you just did. That is, they they see themselves. Uh, as, for instance, uh, into advocacy for you know gay and lesbians, or advocacy for African Americans, or advocacy for minorities in general, or whatever it is, uh, gender issues, women issues, and so on and so forth. Now, I don't think there is anything wrong about an academic uh, an academic engaging in advocacy. As you know, that's what I do on yes. a regular basis, but I don't do it in class. That's right. I do think there is something fundamentally wrong. In fact, it's a betrayal of yes. higher education to engage in po uh, political advocacy, explicit political advocacy in a classroom. And I know some of my colleagues disagree and that's too bad. Uh, and, you know, I'm, 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 I'm pretty clear on, in my own mind on that line. I mean, for instance, give, let me give you an example. You know, I'm, I'm an atheist. I never, ever advocate for atheism in class. Never. Even when it is an obviously easy thing to do. For instance, this semester I'm teaching an introductory philosophy uh, class and, you know, we're going to have discussions about gods and God and arguments a, 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 a against or in favor of the existence of God and then the relationship with morality and God. We'll talk about the utifer the lamb and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I guarantee you that I do my best to present the arguments, period, and to explain the arguments. You argue one way and the other. They know what I think. Again, because even if I don't tell them, all they need to do is to go to my blog or to or, or read one of my books, and then they'll know exactly what I what I what I think. But no, it's not going to come across in uh, in the course of my lectures uh, because you should not. It, it ought not, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I so I do think that to a certain extent, um, the the liberals in the academy have brought this scrutiny on themselves. Yeah, um, because of this explosion of advocacy studies so to speak right. um and also because there are even some traditional disciplines that define themselves this way i mean hasn't this been a criticism of, of anthropology going all the way back to Mar margaret mead uh yes that it, it has that, that it's that it's not really straightforwardly neutral science right. um, um right. and so uh i i think i think I don't want to give too much credence to the to that criticism, but I do think it's not. I think it's not entirely baseless. Yeah, uh, you're, you're right. And, and to be fair, you know, one needs to acknowledge it. And and I'm I'm talking as a liberal and so on and yeah, so forth. Right? Me too. Like, me too. Yeah. Um, you're right. In fact, anthropology is. is you're, you're you're absolutely correct. It's the sort of the quintessential example. And in fact, a few this was a few years ago, two or three years ago. I think there was a major split on that on that ground between cultural and physical anthropologists. Uh, where yeah. the physical anthropologists see themselves explicitly as scientists and therefore, regardless of their own opinions and their own awareness of the fact that there are issues with, you know, indigenous populations and so on and so forth. I mean, those those are issues that, you know, uh, need to be considered in doing research. I mean, there is, a, there is an issue of uh, ethics of research, for instance, which doesn't apply only to anthropologists, but it applies in, in general to, you know, uh, anybody who interacts with other human beings or even with the environment at large, you know, other, other species. So one can be definitely aware of, you know, issues of, of justice or fairness and proper use and so on and so forth and proper, proper conduct, uh, while at the same time maintain a neutral uh, uh, position from from point of view of researcher. And so the, the cultural anthropologists don't buy that. And uh, I think that's to, the, to their detriment, to the detriment of, the, of their discipline. Of course, not all of them don't buy it. Yeah. Right? So there's, there's this discussions there. So, yeah, it, you're right. That criticism, I think it's fair. Uh, I think it has... Uh, marked anthropology, as you say, for a long time, but it has expanded to uh, other branches of the academy, especially within the humanities, uh, yeah. over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, I think, um, you know, a first uh, clear example of that was uh, the, the famous or infamous uh, science wars of the 1990s between sort of a yeah. postmodernist, um, uh, you know, humanities faculty and on the one hand and the sciences on the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... We're, I want to move on now to to the question of of, of the importance of uh, the the academy uh, and academics speaking to the public, and we're now talking not in the classroom, of course, because we're not talking just about the relationship between the the students who and the and and the and the faculty who are their teachers, but to the general public. And um, rather than just ask you an open question, let me throw something out, and then you can sort of respond to it and 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 bring your own perspective to bear. Um, it seems to me that one of the basic mistakes we've been making as a culture in the United States is increasingly conceiving of the purpose of, of the value of higher education purely in terms of 
uh, how well it prepares people to participate in the economy. Right. And what it has lost sight of is the role that the academy and that higher learning plays in preparing us to be citizens of a liberal democracy. Right. And so I wonder if that's part of the problem, and that is that the 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 people are increasingly disinclined to, to listen to the ac academics and to be interested in what academics are doing because they've increasingly lost sight of the fact that one doesn't just need to be prepared to participate in the economy. One needs to be prepared to be a citizen. Right. Um, and I'm wondering if you, if you, if you agree with that and if you think that that lies at the heart of why it's important for the academy to reach out to the public. Oh, I absolutely agree. Uh, now on the one hand, of course, this is nothing new. Uh, we go back to, uh, some of the, <laughs> I'm using, I'm going to use a controversial word, Robert Barron's, uh, like Carnegie and uh, and Rockefeller, and you know who were uh, openly complaining about you know why why people would study um, uh, things that are completely useless from point of, from a practical point of view, from an economy point of view. This is a fundamentally uh, fundamental, well well known type of anti intellectualism uh, that goes back uh, you know at more than a century, a century and a half at least in the United States, which is you know is something is not a practical interest, uh, then it's it's not worth uh, pursuing. It's rather ironic, of course, that the vocal, uh, the people that complained vocally about that at the time uh, ended up then funding with their own money, you know, a large, large number of universities, public libraries, uh, yeah. and other <laughs> cultural institutions. But, you know, there goes the contradictions of life. Uh, but I do think you're right that this uh, has, the problem has, in fact, worsened um, over the last maybe decade or two. Um, and it's it's going to be interesting, you know. I, I would like to to hear the opinion of a sociologist for for why that is exactly. Uh, I'm sure that somebody has opinions about it, and even better, it would be to to have data uh, showing what kind of cultural forces and social forces have brought about this change. But the change the change itself is definitely happened, and it still it keeps happening. Uh, and yes, we are losing. Uh, track of the idea that a university education is supposed to be mostly, I would argue, um, not about uh, preparing you to uh, do a particular job. Th that goes back to the to the issue of vocational schools that we were talking earlier. Uh, you know, there is an alternative for that, um, but rather to become a citizen and become a, an informed citizen in in a democratic, uh, open society means to develop skills such as, you know, literacy, uh, as in not just. English literacy, although that's nice too, but also literacy about history and about you know science yeah, as well, yeah. um, because then we are all in, in, involved in public debates, uh, and uh, even 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 if you don't actually go out there and become an activist on any of these issues, you're still going to vote. Uh, presumably, and you're going to vote for people who, let's say, deny uh, climate change, or you know, you're going to support uh, people who don't want to vaccinate their kids because they think that there is a connection between vaccines and autism. And all of these things are a matter of literacy, critical thinking, you know, ability to actually figure out, uh, uh, at, at the best of our knowledge, uh, what's the what's correct and what's incorrect. But even more broadly than that, I would say that the point of, of a college education is uh, to expand the mind so that you can figure out for yourself what you want to do in, your, in, in life, right? I mean, it's, it is the idea of creating or helping to create an autonomous uh, human being capable of thinking uh, on his own or her own about not just specific issues such as climate change, vaccines and all that, but in general, you know, what do you want to do in your life? What, what kind of person you want to be? How are you going to get there? What sort of things, you know, what is meaningful for you in life other than getting a job? Yes, we all need to get a job for sure. Uh, but we also need a bunch of other things. We need relationships. We need friends. We need, uh, you know, most of us going to have kids. Uh, we need a meaningful job, not just a job. Uh, we we need to to feel a member like a member of a of a, of a society uh, in in a meaningful way, and all of that stuff uh, is stuff toward which a uh, good liberal arts education, which I actually argue should start definitely in high school, if not earlier. Uh, but then, yeah, I was gonna actually actually stop right there because sure. I wanted to push you. I wanted to push you on this a little bit okay. because the things you're describing everyone should have yeah and so that then would sound like you're advocating universal college education yeah. but i thought that before we were saying you know really we should have more tracks like they have in europe so it almost sounds to me like the things you're describing need to be done in high school which is universal education yeah um 
Um, uh, it seems a little odd to say only people who go to college need to be given skills for citizenship, right? Right. Now, if you if you put it that way, absolutely, it's rather odd. Um, but you can also look at it in terms of sort of it, it, gradually, right? So things developing uh, a, a view of the world, developing as a person, and so on and so forth comes in degrees. And so, yes, I agree. The foundations should be there way before college. Uh, and in fact, again, that is how often uh, a lot of European countries work in terms of high school. So, for instance, that's right. You know, a lot of the courses that that students here take as sort of general education uh, courses in college, I took in in high school <laughs> when right. I was in Italy, and right. and that was precisely the idea that because high school is mandatory and college is not, you want everybody to have a minimum. Uh, sort of access to general culture and general ability to sort of think critically and so on and so forth. But then you also have, of course, uh, those people, that subset of people who go on into uh, to college and presumably are going to go also go further and, and play, you know, some kind of, you know, major role in society. You know, some of these right. people are going to become, you know, policy advisors or, or politicians themselves or um, you know, movers or shakers in one way or the other at different levels. I mean, you're right. not everybody becomes the president of the United States, of course, but that's not the only way to affect society. And so the idea is that then you need the same kind of general basic education that everybody else should need, and then some. Uh, and so college is going to bring you the level, one level up, uh, and, you know, further going to further detail uh, on, on your appreciation of historical perspectives, cultural perspectives, uh, and scientific uh, you know, uh, literacy and so on and so forth. So I see that as a gradual um, yeah. uh, uh, issue and, and a gradualist issue and therefore not, not mutually exclusive. It's not that unless you get a college education, you, you don't develop those, but it is also the case that in a college education, within the context of a college education, you have a further chance to develop those, those uh, general skills, which as I said earlier, also are um, very highly correlated to portable skills, such as critical writing and critical thinking. Uh, which are really useful for anything. Uh, yeah. Although I have to say that given the current state of American primary and secondary education, yeah. it really is rapidly becoming the case that unless you go to college, you get no background in this stuff at all, um, right. um, which which I take to be highly problematic. Right. Um, so, but, so let me ask you, what? The, so separate from the purpose regarding citizenship and, and participation in liberal democracy, aside from the role that the university plays with respect to its enrolled students, its degree program enrolled students. Why is it important that the academy also regularly communicate with the public, not through its degree programs, but in, in the ways that you're trying to do with Ciencia Salon and the ways that you've advocated that academics need to do more generally, we need to be talking to the public about what we're doing and we need to be talking to them in a way that, they, that that's digestible to them. Right. Why is that important to do beyond the classroom? Yeah, so this, this is a good point, I guess, to, to talk a little bit about the slight, what I thought was a slight uh, course correction for Cientia Salon. And it turned out, as you know, to be much more controversial than I expected. Uh, which I thought it was interesting thing. So, so Cientia Salon from the beginning was supposed to be a place mostly of, uh, for academics, for colleagues who want to engage in the, with the general public and they don't necessarily have the time or the skills or the inclination to maintain their own blogs or, you know, cultivate their own social networks. As you know, that's a lot of work. Uh, you know, I spend a significant amount of time during my week and even during the weekend uh, sort of curating the, the the magazine and you know editing pieces and then uh, yeah. filtering co uh, comments and then of course uh, spreading uh, the the word on on a number of uh, of social platforms you know I'm on Twitter I'm on Facebook I'm on Google Plus blah 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 so that's a significant amount of, of work and I decided that uh, this is a good use of my time uh, and I certainly don't pretend that uh, that should be a common decision among my colleagues. I'm in a rather unusual position. I have, uh, I'm lucky enough to be at a tenure professor with an endowed chair, so I have much more latitude than, than even most of my own colleagues about what I do and how I spend my time, and so I decided to use it uh, in, in this way. Um, what why? happened? <laughs> why? Right, right, why, right. why is it important you do this in addition to what you do in the classroom? Why is it important to do this? Well, for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, if you take the mission of, of the academy at, at, at heart, 
uh, it is really supposed to be for the betterment of humankind. Uh, it is supposed to be, uh, even when you just do research, right? Uh, it, it's supposed to be research to increase the, the store of knowledge and in in the understanding of, of the world uh, for all of humanity, not just for your own personal curiosity. Um, so that's one part of the answer. But the other part of the answer is that let's not forget that most academics rely largely on, or at least to a, to a, to a certain extent, on public money. Even those that don't work in public, I work in a public university, so in my case, all of my uh, funds come from, from the public, right? From the public purse. But even if you work at a, a private university, I was at Brown University, for instance, for a while, uh, but I was there as a scientist. And, you know, all of my research money still uh, came from the National Science Foundation. That's, that's a federal agency and it's, it's public money. Right, right. So uh, one way or the other, either all of it or a significant chunk of it, uh, of the money that comes into universities, does in fact come from, from, from the public. And so it seems to me that we have, uh, that that sort of binds us uh, as academics, morally, ethically, to give back. Now, part of that give back, of course, is you do your research the way you're supposed to do it. You do your best. Uh, you don't cheat. You don't, you know, go and engage in academic fraud and all that sort of stuff. That's a minimum level standard, right? Um, the second level, of course, is to seriously engage in your teaching. I mean, one of, the one of the things that I don't understand, and frankly, I cannot stand, is when I hear my colleagues, some of my colleagues, fortunately, not that many, as it turns out, but when I hear some of my colleagues sort of complain about the teaching, oh my gosh, I have to teach a course to this. I mean, well, of course you have to teach a course. It's part of the bargain. Um, you're a this, teacher. This, you know, this, you're a teacher. You're like, in right. fact, most people, you know, a lot of people sort of forget that that's what we're hired for, in theory. I mean, I understand that, you know, wink, wink, in a research university, especially, you're really yeah. hired to do your research. But frankly, the taxpayers, especially if you are, again, at a public university, don't really give a damn about your research or not that much, especially right. when it's not research that is directly uh, practical. You know, it's one thing That's if right. you're hired as a cancer research researcher. Yeah. It's another thing if you're uh, hired as a Shakespeare scholar or, or a, a Kant scholar. You know, yeah. most people don't give a damn about knowing more about Shakespeare or Kant. Uh, right. And they're not going to give you the big bucks such as they are uh, to do that sort of stuff. This is, this is, you're just lucky that you get paid and you have lee, lee, uh, oh. leeway and, and time to pursue what are essentially your own interests, intellectual interests. And in the bargain, however, you're supposed to be doing a good job as a teacher, you know, as, a, as good a job as, as you can. So that's number two. But there is a third component to what we do, which usually goes under the rubric of uh, um, um, service, right? Now, most universities and, and a lot of faculty interpret service to mean internal service, you know, yeah. serving on a committee. Committee work. Yeah, yeah, committee work and all that sort of stuff. Well, frankly, to me, that is the least interesting, the least consequential and the, the most avoidable type of service that there is. I mean, the minimum of it needs to be done. You know, I, I'm a former department chair, so I know exactly um, what I'm talking about in this case. And I can tell you that at least 20% of that service really does need to be done. 80%, I'm not so sure about the yeah. remaining 80%. It could, could be cut down significantly. Yeah. But I do see, I have always interpreted service as including also service to the community. And although, of course, I do not expect uh, the majority of my colleagues to do service for the community to the extent that I am doing it now. I've, I haven't always done it this way, right? I mean, I, I was there was a period in my career where I was much more focused on my research and 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 so on. But but um, in part it is my calling. So in part it's my own decision. You know, I think I feel good about doing what I'm doing, and I think it is important. I, I quite frankly. You know, whenever I publish, I mean, I, I do it. It's also a matter of a little bit doing a little bit of math, right? So when I publish in a new technical paper, which I do on a regular basis, I, I still do my research and I and I publish in, in uh, you know technical journals. But when I when one of my technical papers comes come out, yeah, you know, I'm lucky if a few hundred people are going to read it. You know, that's that's about the size of you know the academic community in, yeah. in a very specific, very small uh, subfield of scholarship. Um, on the other hand, I write a, an essay for uh, you know the New York Times, for instance. Today, uh, I, I, the New York Times published an essay that I wrote about stoicism. Uh, that's going to be read by tens of thousands of people, if not more, and uh, it's going to you know reach a lot of people, and it's going to make a lot yeah. of people think, and it's going to be a lot of people engage in discussions that I think are, are are worth engaging in. So even just from a sheer perspective of how much impact you're going to make, you know, there's there's this thing in uh, in uh, 
academic bean counting, uh, when you go up for tenure, uh, you're supposed to demonstrate uh, numbers in hand that your papers have any an impact. In fact, there is such a thing as an impact factor for a paper, right, for a journal. Yeah. And the impact factor, of course, is, is uh, proportional to the number of citations that your uh, papers get. And, and it's, it's incredible to me that if we actually measure, if we really are supposed to be measuring the impact that we make by the number of people we demonstrably reach, uh, then we should do a lot less research and a lot more uh, uh, public outreach because the public outreach demonstrably reaches a lot more people uh, yeah. than than any academic paper. So that's what I do. In, in part is a, you know that's why I do it. In part, in part is a combination of what I feel ought to be done in terms of sort of duty to to our society at large, and in part is just because I like it and I, I think it's a good use of my time. That brings me to the, if you don't mind, uh, to the Scientia Salon sort of. Uh, slight change, you know, correction. So it, yeah, what, what yeah. happened in the during the mag in, during the first year of the magazine is that uh, a number of you know, as you as you know, uh, we have a good number of very uh, sophisticated readers and commenters uh, on uh, at, at the magazine, and some of them have started submitting uh, articles for publication, and uh, some of them are actually pretty good. And so I looked at them and and I published a number of them during the first year. But then what happened was that this was becoming an increasingly larger chunk of what was get, was happening. I, I suspect, in part, because there's a lot of readers who are not academics, and so once that the the word spreads that the magazine accepts submissions from non-academics, then lots more people are going to make uh, submit papers uh, articles, uh, which is not going in the direction that I wanted to do to go because you know there's a lot lots of blogs out there and lots of platforms for anybody who wants to say anything to to do it uh, on the other hand there is a comparatively very very small number of academics who actually write for the general public on a more or less regular basis and that was that was what the original niche for Ciencia Salon was supposed to be so on the one hand I saw uh, the magazine going in a direction that not only was not the original intent but was also sort of discouraging probably academics uh, from entering into into the fray, or at least they were, their voices were sort of begin, beginning to be drowned by 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 uh, other submissions. Also, yeah. quite frankly, what happens is this was uh, becoming a lot more work for me because, you know, again, I don't want to be politically. It's incorrect. a lot. Of, it's a lot of submissions. It's a lot of submissions, right. and a lot of them are not very high quality. Right. I mean, you, you see the only the ones that make it through the process, obviously. Right. Uh, of course. But there is a larger, much, much larger number of submissions that are not of high quality. In fact, they're often pretty horrible quality, <laughs> but I still have to read them. Yeah. And I still yeah. have to get, get, get through them and I still have to write back to the to the author out of courtesy and explain why the piece is being rejected and so on and so forth. So this was becoming too much work in the wrong direction, or at least in not as useful a direction, not as distinctive a direction um, that, as, as I wanted to go. And that's why I, you know, a month ago or so, I published this editorial, this open letter to my readers, saying, okay, guys, uh, here, this is the situation. I need a little bit of a correction. I'm going to go back to the original intent in a more firm way. From now on, I'm going to accept submissions only from uh, people in the academy because the point of the magazine is to offer a platform for academics who want to write for the general public we want to encourage them to do it but these are people who often don't uh, as i was saying earlier uh, have the time or the inclination or the technical skills necessarily to maintain a blog of their own or, or social yeah. networks of their own okay so as you saw when that happened was you know on the, 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 there was a very dramatic split in the middle you know a number of people say yes that's the way to do it absolutely uh this is going to make the quality of the writings even better and the discussions even better and on the other hand there are people who clearly took offense and, yeah. and thought that this was an elitist uh move and uh i suppose in some sense it is i am I mean, i'm willing to bite the bullet there yeah it's um, dis it's descriptively elitist exactly right yeah. i don't know whether it's normatively elitist no but it's descriptively elitist certainly yeah. not because uh, of course i do recognize that there are uh people who are not academic who write very very good uh, things and in fact sometimes and or uh, uh, things are even better than the submissions that I get from academics but again those people have already a large number of outlets in fact a lot of yeah. our authors my, my authors that are non-academics already have their own blogs and often yes. start the discussion on Ciencia Salon and then move the discussion over to their own blogs yeah um, so I didn't feel that the change was going to be to the detriment of anyone in the general public because they already have a lot of these outlets uh, but at the same time, it was going to bring the sort of the quality of the of the um, 
of the writings and the discussion up. And I think that, quite honestly, I mean, the, the, the changes happened only very recently, so it's we're only a few weeks into it. But uh, from what I've been able to publish from the beginning of the year and what I have uh, now already in the pipeline that I'm looking at at the moment, I actually do think, I feel vindicated at the moment. I, I yeah. feel like uh, there there is a good number of really, really good uh, things that they need to go to get out there. And they would not have seen the light if I had not um, made that decision. I mean, one of the things that I'm doing now is I'm not just waiting around for my colleagues to send me submissions, uh, which occasionally does happen. And, you know, the more people know about the magazine, uh, the, the more likely I, I get unsolicited submissions. But often I solicit submissions. I, I keep an eye on the literature, both in right. philosophy and in science. And whenever I see an interesting technical paper written by somebody, I write to the authors and I say, hey, would you mind writing a sort of a, a shorter version or an accessible version talking about the same topics because I think it's interesting and, and, and a larger people uh, really ought to know about it. All right, so so let me, um, we're, we're getting to the last chunk and so I, I just wanted to maybe add something with regard to this question of what distinctively is important about the about academic outreach to the public not via teaching in the degree programs, but speaking to the people who are not students. Um, and I, I wondered if maybe, you know, you talked about a kind of a giving back that you in a sense owe it because uh, right. public, the public is financing much of what we do. Um, also, um, 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 you spoke about it in terms of pra a pragmatic reason, and that is, um, you know, it's, it's helpful to the public, you know, it, it, if they have a better sense of what you're about, they're more likely to support the funding, right? Yes. <laughs> so there's a practical there's a practical end to it too. But I'm wondering if there's also a role related to what we were talking about earlier, and that is education for civil for for being a citizen in a liberal democracy, because a college degree has now become increasingly specialized, right. and we, we're shrinking more and more the role of general education. You have more and more people who are even college educated who know one thing and don't know anything else. So That's they know a ton about literature, they know nothing about science. They know a ton about science, they know nothing about philosophy. And so I almost wonder whether activities like yours serve in a sense after the after the fact to help round people out a bit, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that I can go now, and there's a lot of places where I can get some pretty decent science education pitched at right. a level that I can understand it um, uh, that I didn't get because I didn't take any science classes in college or I only took one. Or in other words, I'm wondering if it, if it does play the role of almost making up for the fact that our, our, our college educations are less and less liberal in their content. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. Of course, I, I don't pretend that Ciencia Salon by itself <laughs> can, can No, but that all sort of, of them right? together. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. There's a number of outlets like this. And frankly, um, uh, I think that what is nice about, you know, there's all sorts of not so nice and not so positive things about the Internet. But there are some really, really nice ones. Uh, one of them is, of course, the availability of, of online courses that if you really want to, you're, you're curious and you want to get yeah. up on, on a completely different field. Uh, you can take all sorts of introductory courses often for free. This is, by the way, in my mind, the only good use of the so-called MOOCs, the, yeah. the massive online um, uh, yeah. open uh, courses. Uh, they're not going to replace uh, actual college education. They're not going to replace the classroom experience. Uh, it's already pretty clear data in hand. Again, uh, you know, I'm an evidence-based kind of guy. Uh, that they're not going to work in that sense, but they're certainly a, a stupendous uh, resource for people who want to continue their education, their own education yeah. after college at their own pace and looking at things that they, they interest them. So that's one thing. But then there's outlets like Ciencia Salon and, and others where what you get is not only a furthering, of course, of your education because you're exposed, as you were saying, to essays in philosophy, uh, history, um, uh, science, and so on and so forth. Um, but you also get a sense of what academics themselves are working on right now. So what are the, yeah. the, the hot things, the hot topics, right? The stuff that you don't necessarily get in the introductory courses. Yeah. Uh, you get a sense. That's what I want to bring uh, out to the public. Uh, for instance, um, just let me give an example. Later this week, uh, one of my colleagues is going to publish in Ciencia Salon a, uh, what I, I expect is going to be a controversial uh, article arguing that fish don't, don't feel pain. <laughs> and uh, now, of course, this is first of all relevant to very practical discussions about ethics. You know, I can 
uh, speak as somebody who pays attention to where these meals are coming from, uh, both from a point of view of treat treatment of animals and from point of view of you know environmental impact. So I'm actually directly interested in these kind of things. But at the same time, I don't go for the uh, you know sort of extreme and not necessarily evidence based. Uh, version of, of that approach. I want to know I, as much as we can tell, you know, what what's going on in, in with other animals, what's going on with, with fish in this case in particular. And the article is very well argued. It's very interesting. You know, it can be, of course, uh, some of the points can be argued against, but it does give practical, you know, evidence-based uh, reasons for the author's claim that right. it's unlikely that, that fish actually feel anything like pain uh, as it is instead, pres instead present in, um, in so-called higher vertebrates, mostly in mammals. Now, you may disagree or agree with, with, that, with, the, with the take of the author, but the point is, this is a, a theoretically interesting question, because it's, it's a question that goes to the very nature of the relationship between brain structures and, and consciousness. It is an eminently practical question because it goes at the core of our ethical behavior every day when, when we go to the grocery store and decide what to buy uh, for dinner. Um, and it comes from somebody who is actually doing research on this issue right now. Uh, right. So this this is I think the kind of thing that that it's that we need more of and that the Ciencia Salon is trying to do. No, I agree with that entirely. Um, uh, I, I myself, the um, the introductory introduction to philosophy class that I teach, I did a video version of the entire course um, as a distance learning project. But what's happening now is that you know anybody can watch it. So I've got people emailing me from all over the planet, <laughs> telling me how much they like the course and asking me for suggested readings of you know, people I don't know, people who I have right. no relationship. And I, I, I do have to say it's a very rewarding experience to realize that, hey, you know, uh, this is this is providing people who want to self-educate with something that they couldn't uh, that they wouldn't right. otherwise have. So I, right. I completely agree with you. Uh, let's if you don't mind um, in our last in our last few minutes, could we talk a little bit about experts? Sure. Um, um, because I think this is actually really important. Um, um, for, for, first of all, this is a general matter. What, and I'm going to use a technical term here, but maybe you'll, uh, maybe you can unpack it for me. Um, what do you think actually really is the epistemic standing of expert testimony on a subject? Ooh. In other, in other, in other, in other words, the fact that some, you know, so, so a climate scientist tells me, um, you got to reduce your carbon emissions because this stuff is going up in the atmosphere and it's going to have the following effect and the following things are going to happen in the future. Right. Now, suppose I know nothing about this. Right. What's the status of that sort of testimony? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, and there's a, a whole uh, area of philosophy of expertise, for instance, that has been developing over the last several years. And uh, there is, of course, a sociology of expertise as well. Um, the, the question of expertise is a really complex one, and, and it's a crucial one, because we all rely on experts. I mean, on, on the one hand, you know, uh, one, one of the things that you hear often, uh, is, especially in so-called skeptic communities, is that if you're, if you're relying on somebody else's opinion, you're making a, a, you know, a, a, an argument from authority, and that's a logical fallacy. Well, not really. Right. Uh, it depends on what that authority is. You know, if I go to the, if I have a toothache and I go to the dentist, uh, yes, I am relying on authority, but presumably <laughs> I have good reasons to rely on that authority. I'm not going to go to a mechanic for, for that. Right. Um, so the question isn't it, whether it's a good idea or not a good idea to rely on expertise. We all have to. Just, you know, we, we, we don't have that kind of, none of us has that kind of general expertise, general kind of knowledge on all sorts of subject matters, practical and theoretical, that would allow us to do without experts. We, we go to experts all the time. You know, the, your doctor is an expert, your mechanic is an expert, That's your right. teacher is an expert, and so on and so forth. So uh, this, this, is, this should be normal. This should be understood as, of course you do. Now, the question, of course, is, first of all, expert in what and says who? Right, so what it, what, it's a question of credentials. Um, and it's a question also of consensus among experts. So if you go for, for instance, and, and also it's a question of domain of expertise, right? So one of the problems that I noticed, for instance, with famous scientists, which shall go unnamed, uh, I'm not going to make <laughs> examples, uh, but, but you will recognize the type because it's actually fairly common that scientists, a lot of scientists, not certainly not all of them, but a lot of scientists, when they become popular enough, either because they won the Nobel Prize, kudos to them, 
or because they you know get on television or radio and become sort of a, uh, celebrities essentially they begin to talk about with with authority right? not not that just their personal opinion because anybody everybody's entitled to their personal opinion about everything but if you talk about with with well, about something with authority then it is reasonable for me to question where that authority uh, comes from so if i have a physicist who talks with authority about let's say quantum mechanics um, i'm fine with that a physicist even if he's not even doing research on quantum mechanics probably knows more about quantum mechanics than i do but if i hear that physicist talking authoritatively about let's say <laughs> the value of philosophy um, I do have reasonable doubt about, you know, why is it, why is that person talking about this thing? Because he's clearly not an expert on this. Now you mentioned climate change. Yeah, let's make it a little harder than that. How about a okay. physicist talking about climate science? Right. So I don't think that a lot of physicists necessarily are uh, have the level of expertise that would uh, grant them, you know, w would make it reasonable for them to talk about detailed issues in climate science uh, with confidence. Now, it depends on what level you're talking about. Like, so let me give you a, a parallel example. Let's say we're talking about a biologist who, who, who speaks about evolutionary biologist, even evolutionary biology, even though he's maybe a molecular biologist. Well, so if we're talking about highly technical issues in evolutionary biology, like you know the latest rounds of discussions about levels of selection or something like that, then probably just because you're a biologist, you're not qualified to talk at that level, because that's a fairly high level. You really do need an evolutionary biologist. And in fact, possibly you even need, need a subset of evolutionary biologists right. to actually specifically work in that area, right? But if we're talking about, you know, can a, a general genetic biologist sort of give a talk about evolution to the general public? Sure, I, I you know, I, I, would, I would hope that that person is able to do that sort of stuff. So in part, it depends on what, what the occasion is and what, um, what the claim of expertise actually is so a physicist probably knows more about uh the kind of issues that enter into climate science than any anybody else let's say than a biologist or an ecologist or something like that but if we're talking about specifics the specifics of climate change models uh you know the specifics of of the reliability of of the evidence brought about in terms of of you know reaching certain conclusion, then I probably would, would want a climate scientist, not right. just a physicist, a genetic right. physicist, right? That seems reasonable to me. Now, the additional issue uh, comes about when there is no consensus within the field. By consensus, I don't mean, uh, uh, you know, 100% agreement, of course, but, you know, a, a large majority of people within that field agree on something. Because there are certain, I mean, science uh, any any academic that's true for any academic field but science in particular by its very nature uh is certainly open to internal disagreement and and there is a number of notions within s science that are in fact currently being debated like for instance just this morning i read this interesting article uh that it's kind of uh debunking the claim uh that came out last year about discovery of evidence for uh, cosmic inflation uh, right, so the the very the, the this very early uh, expansion, rapid expansion of the universe. Uh, yeah. It turned out last year, uh, satellite observations seem to show evidence of for the inflation theory, and right now these these are actually being uh, this, you know, largely discredited. There's, there's been better observations, and uh, the new data don't seem to support the original interpretation. Now, this is something about which. I, as a scientist, cannot comment because it's way outside of my domain of expertise. But not only that, as it turns out, I assume that there are there is disagreement even among cosmologists. And right. so I would actually take with a little bit of grain of salt a cosmologist who says, yes, this has been completely debunked or no, this is still valid. And it's, it's, it's probably an open question. The very fact that there is discussion within the, the community, the, the relevant epistemic community, as you put it earlier, in this case, cosmologists, means that we as the general public should simply be neutral and sort of agnostic about it. Say, OK, you guys sell this thing and then let us know what your best judgment is. With the proviso, of course, that, that even a, uh, a consensus within a scientific community uh, may, in fact, not necessarily uh, be a consensus about the truth. I mean, you know, the scientific community has had consensus in the past about things that turned out to be wrong. Yeah, so let, let's let's focus on that for, uh, I, I know we're going a little long, but this is our last thing and it seems to be important. I mean, sure. look, um, it sounds to me like you're saying, Ceteris Paribus, 
um, a, a substantial consensus among the relevant experts is sufficient um, to, for it to carry a certain authority in the sense that people ought to listen to it, okay? That's right. Um, but I'm wondering if the consensus alone is sufficient or whether also another independent variable is the relevant status of the, the relative status of the science. Now, here's what I'm getting at. Um, 30 years ago, um, there was a consensus among people who study uh, diet and nutrition right. as to what the healthy diet was, okay? And it was low fat and high carb, okay? Right. Well, now pretty much that's completely not true. I mean, that's been completely rejected. Yeah. Um, we now make all sorts of distinctions between good fats and bad fats. We yeah. now know that carbs turn into sugar in your body and all this other sort of stuff. Um, whereby the con if you took the consensus now, it would be almost diametrically the opposite. And this is in a very short period of time. I'm talking about 30 years, which is nothing. Right. Okay. And so it seems to me that part of the reason for that is because it's not sufficient merely that the consensus be there, but that the science be at a, a relative state of advancement and sophistication, that mm -hmm. the consensus actually means something, right? Because yeah. otherwise, it's just bandwagons, right? I mean, it's yeah. just, it's a, and so... I'm wondering if in the case of, of climate science, so someone like a, 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 a Freeman Dyson, who is not a stupid man, I mean, no. right? I mean, if part of the critique is a meta critique, what he's saying is, and partly, you know, the science is very young. They've only been collecting data on weather for 150 years. The right. earth is billions of years old. Um, and so no matter what the experts say, no conclusion that anyone could draw could carry that sort of authority given the relevant youth of the science and and the fact that you've had wild uh, 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 shifts in consensus since right. the 70s. You remember the global cooling scare in the 70s? Yeah. And we, we were going to have a new ice age and it was on the cover of Time magazine. And so I wonder, is consensus enough or does there also have to take into account the relative, relative status of the science itself? No, I think you're right. It certainly does have to take into account the, the relative status of the science. That said, I think that uh, nutrition science is in much worse uh, uh, shape uh, than, than, than climate science. And, Why? And for a, Why? Well, for a, variety, for a variety of reasons. First of all, the, the example you brought up, the, 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 the so-called scare, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the um, uh, Ice Age scare, that was actually demonstrably, and I looked into, into this some time ago, uh, this was demonstrably largely a media, a media thing. There was actually no consensus within the scientific community about that sort of stuff. Uh, even then, it was just some people who became particularly vocal and they b got picked up by, by, by the media. That's the other uh, uh, sort of part of the equation that we need to be careful about, right? So uh, how do we know about consensus within a scientific community? Um, yeah, there is often the media, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> often this is mediated by by media who themselves don't necessarily have a particularly good understanding of what the consensus is. So one needs to be careful about that. Um, there's also, I think, one reason that I think uh, uh, Freeman Dyson is being overly pessimistic about climate science is that uh, yes, it's true that we've been collecting direct data about the the environment for only you know 100 plus years, but we also have uh, lots of methods that tell us about climate change you know from a paleont on a paleontological yes, scale. Yes, yeah, it's not it's not like we don't do that sort of stuff. Indirect, not only that, but we also data, yeah. Right. Well, in, yeah. Not only that, but we also have comparative data. Um, there is you know I remember when I was a kid. Uh, in uh, 1976, the Viking landers uh, arrived on Mars, and uh, that night I decided that it was going to be a nice thing to be, you know, a good good career move to be a, a um, planetologist, you know, somebody who studies planet planetary atmospheres in a comparative fashion. That's because the Italian host of the event uh, that night was in fact a planetologist. And I thought, wow, that's cool. And I, I want to be a planetologist. So people have actually been studying comparative atmospheres. You know, we know a lot, a lot about increasingly more about the atmospheres, for instance, of our uh, uh, planetary neighbors, Mars right, on the one right, hand and right. Venus on the other hand. So it's, it's, it's more than just, you know, the last uh, 100 years or so of data. That said, you know, is climate science as advanced as, I don't know, fundamental physics? No. And I, I don't think anybody's pretending that that right. to be the case. The other thing to consider is this, um, you know, even even let's go back even to your example of sort of nutrition science, right? Yes, yeah. you're right. The, the consensus, there was a consensus been overturned and now there is a different consensus. Now, on the one end, then therefore one could say, oh, you know what? I, they, these people have no idea what they're talking about. 
I'm just going to eat whatever the hell I want. I still think that would be a bad move uh, because it's still your best bet, other things being equal, mm. uh, to say, well, let me at least pay attention to what these people did. Because after all, these things, uh, even the overturning of the consensus does come out of research. Yeah. Now, that research is, of course, complicated because nutrition science is complicated. It's very difficult to do controlled experiments. It's very difficult to, there's a lot of variables uh, that act simultaneously that have to do with lifestyle, with genetics. You know, there's all sorts of stuff. Uh, going on. So, yeah, even the current consensus, I would take it with a fairly large grain of salt, but I wouldn't dismiss it entirely, yeah, yeah. right? Because after all, there's still, there are reasons why these people have arrived to the, to the current consensus. Right. And this, this is the best bet that human beings currently can make in that area. Is it a good bet? I don't know. I guess we'll figure it out eventually. But it's still a better bet than just me going on randomly and eating whatever yeah. comes across on yeah. my path. Right. Yeah, I, you know, it reminds me, and we can finish on this, it reminds me, I don't know if you remember this part and from Descartes' discourse on method, but Descartes at one point, he says, look, um, at a certain point, one has to act. Right. And the question then, you know, in, in other words, what he's, what he's cautioning against is people drawing the wrong conclusion from skepticism, right? right. Or even exactly. from substantial doubt, right? Exactly. At, at the end of the day, you have to act. And, and then what you, you have to do is you have to make the best choice you can, right? Right. And so I guess what you're saying in a sense is the best choice we can is to listen to the people who at least study this a lot, right? Exactly. Even if even if their track record isn't so great and maybe right. we're taking a little more with a grain of salt, I think right. in the case of climate science, part of the problem is that some of the remedies that are being proposed have such an enormous economic impact that, that it, it causes people to sort of uh, hesitate Am I willing to go so far and have such a sort of major change in order and something that's not certain? But right. but I, I do think that the less of what you're saying is sort of a general truth. Right. And that is that we have to be, you know, we on the one hand have to be very, very sure to allow doubt, doubt to be cultivated. But we Correct. also have to put it in its right place relative to action. Right. Otherwise, there's paralysis. You do nothing. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I think the card was right, on, at least on that count. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay, well, this is this is awfully interesting. I could do we could do this for three hours. I have other topics, um, but the audience won't tolerate it. Yeah, um, probably and not. You and I, and I'm sure you have better things to do. I don't know if I do, but you do. Um, so I want to thank you again for uh, for another really enjoyable conversation. It was a pleasure, Dan, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you. All right, bye bye. Bye.